Good morning and welcome to KCPS Homeroom. I'm Justin Robinson. Again, today is for first and second grade students. We will start off with reading, then a math class, science class, intro to Chinese, and finally STEM. Hope you enjoy class today. Let's get ready to learn with Mr. Hall and reading. Hello and welcome back. My name is Mr. Hall and today we are going to talk about understanding characters using the text. Today, we are going to read the story called Amazing Grace, and we are going to understand her character by justifying it with traits. Now, good readers make inferences about characters based on their thoughts, the character's feelings, their actions, and the relationships that they have with others. So our, our character that we're gonna focus on today, her name is Grace. We're gonna think about what Grace thinks, what she feels, what she does or her actions and the relationships that she has with others as we read. Our I can statement today is, I can use text evidence to support character traits. Let's go ahead and get started. Grace was a girl who loved stories. She didn't mind if they were read to her or told to her or even made up in her own head. She didn't care if they were from books or movies or out of Nana's long memory. Grace just loved stories, and after she had heard them, and sometimes while they were still going on, Grace would act them out, and she always gave herself the most exciting part. Look at Grace and her Nana. Grace went into battle as Joan of Arc and wove a wicked web as Anansi the Spider. She hid inside the wooden horse at the gates of Troy. She went exploring for lost kingdoms. She sailed the seven seas with a peg leg and a parrot. Let's look at this page. Now, I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna think. What do I know about Grace so far? I know that Grace enjoys acting out stories and she loves listening to them and she loves getting them from Nana's long memory. So if I could think of a word that describes Grace right now, I would say that Grace is very imaginative. She uses her imagination a whole lot so far. Let's go back to the text and see. How do we know that she's super imaginative and she uses her imagination a whole lot? Well, if we go back to the text, we know that Grace is acting out stories. It even says she wove a wicked web like a Nazi the spider. Look right here on this page. Or right here, uh, John of Arc went into battle. That's another example. Let's continue with the story. She was Aladdin rubbing his magic lamp to make the genie appear and Mowgli in the backyard jungle. That was a reference to the Jungle Book and Aladdin. Most of all, Grace loved to act out adventure stories and fairy tales. When there was no one else around, Grace played all the parts herself. She set out to seek her fortune with no companion but her trusty cat and found a city with streets paved of gold. Here she is using her imagination and acting out again. That's a very good example. Sometimes she could get Ma and Nana to join in when they weren't too busy. Then she was Dr. Grace and their lives were in her hands. One day, Grace's teacher said they would do the play Peter Pan. Grace knew who she wanted to be. When she raised her hand, Raj said, you can't be Peter, that's a boy's name. But Grace kept her hand up. You can't be Peter Pan, whispered Natalie. He isn't black. But Grace kept her hand up. All right, said the teacher. Lots of you want to be Peter Pan, so we'll have to have auditions next week to choose parts. She gave them words to learn. Look at Grace. She still has her hand up, even though her classmates don't think that she could actually do a good job of being Peter Pan. When Grace got home, she seemed sad. What's the matter? asked Ma. Raj said, I couldn't be Peter Pan because I'm a girl. 
That just shows what Raj knows, said Ma. A girl can be Peter Pan if she wants to. Grace cheered up. Then later, she remembered something else. Natalie says, I can't be Peter Pan because I'm black, she said. Ma looked angry. But before she could speak, Nana said, it seems Natalie is another one who don't know nothing. You can be anything you want, Grace, if you put your mind to it. Let's stop right here and let's think about what words we could use to describe Grace here. If we think about the story here, we know that Grace has some kind of uncomfortable feeling right now. And as a reader, I can honestly say that Grace feels kind of tense. So a good word to describe Grace right now would certainly be that she's tense. And I would even say that she is tense because her friends don't really believe in her. They don't think that she could do the part the correct way. Let's continue with the story. On Saturday, Nana told Grace they were going out. In the afternoon, they caught a bus and a train into town. Nana took Grace to a grand theater. The sign outside read, Rosalie Wilkins and Romeo and Juliet in sparkling lights. Are we going to the ballet, Nana? Asked Grace. We are, honey. But first, I want you to look at this picture. Grace looked up and saw a beautiful young ballerina in a tutu. Above the dancer, it said, Stunning New Juliet. That one is little Rosalie from back home in Trinidad, said Nana. Her granny and me, we grew up together on the island. She's always asking me, do I want tickets to see her Rosalie dance? So this time, I said yes. After the ballet, Grace played the part of Juliet, dancing around her room in her imaginary tutu. I can be anything I want, she thought. Let's stop right here and let's think about what we know. It took Nana to show Grace the ballet. And it's really impressive because now we realize that Grace has a new kind of trait. And the word that I would use to describe Grace at this present moment is that Grace feels very confident. She's practicing in a tutu all around. She's dancing a whole lot. So she's definitely confident. Let's put that up on our chart. On Monday, the class met for auditions to choose who was best for each part. When it was Grace's turn to be Peter, she knew exactly what to do and all the words to say. She had been Peter Pan all weekend. She took a deep breath and imagined herself flying. When it was time to vote, the class chose Raj to be Captain Hook and Natalie to be Wendy. There was no doubt who would be Peter Pan. Everyone voted for Grace. You were fantastic, whispered Natalie. The play was a big success and Grace was an amazing Peter Pan. After it was all over, she said, I feel as if I could fly all the way home. You probably could, said Ma. Yes, said Nana. If Grace put her mind to it, she can do anything she want. Now I'm gonna stop right here. There's another word that could be used to describe Grace. At this moment in the story, I could say that Grace is very proud. She feels like she's accomplished something, which she has. She ended up being in the play and she got the part that she wanted. And on top of all of that, all of her friends seem to agree. So she is feeling very, very proud right now. Thank you so much for joining me today as we read about, about Grace and we identified the character traits that were used to describe her. In addition to that, we looked at the book and examined any kind of evidence that could be used to justify our answers. Over the next week, I would like you to read a story with the main character, and I would like you to try to identify who the main character is, and then think of words that describe that person. Once you figure out what those words are, I would like you to go back to the text to figure out why you felt that way about that character. Thank you so much and so long. I'll see you again next week. Hello, my name is Mrs. Overish and this is Math Mania for first and second graders. I am so glad you're here today. Let's learn something new in math. Today, we are going to be talking about adding two digit numbers using expanded form. All you need today is a piece of paper and a pencil. 
Let's go over our I can statement. It says, I can add two digit numbers by putting the numbers in expanded form. So a couple weeks ago, we talked about putting numbers in expanded form. Does anyone remember what a putting a number in expanded form means? Yeah, it's showing the value of each digit in a number. So when we're putting a number in expanded form, we're just showing the value of each digit. So right here, I'm gonna write showing value. Because that's all we're doing. Showing value in digits. So we're gonna be adding numbers, which we know is combining or putting together. Combine, put together. So I can combine or put together or add two digit numbers by putting the numbers in expanded form or putting the numbers where we see their value. In math, we use different math tools. Today we're gonna to be using really just our piece of paper, our pencil, I'm gonna be using my board. I'm gonna be using um, what we call an anchor chart or another graphic organizer to help us organize our different steps in our problem. And I'm also gonna be using our number line to help us with some of those simple addition questions as well. So since we're gonna be adding two digit numbers today using expanded form, I think it's important that we review expanded form. So when we put numbers in expanded form, we're showing the value of each digit. So when I say the number 52, I know that I have a 50 or a five in the tens place, which we know really is five tens is 50 and two or two ones. So I have some flashcards here today and I wanna I'm gonna hold them up and I want you to quickly see if you can tell me that number in expanded form when you see it. So here was my example, number 52. And how do we put the number 52 in expanded form? That's right, 50 plus two. Let's try another one. We have the number 39. What number do you see in the tens place? What number do you see in the ones place? What do you hear when you say 39? That's right, this number in expanded form is 30 plus nine. About the number 71. 71. This number in expanded form is 70 plus one. Ooh, trying to trick you here. What about the number 88? 88, how do we put this in expanded form? It has the same number in both places. Hmm. Just because it's the same number doesn't mean that they have the same value. Our number 88 in expanded form is 80 plus eight. And we have the number 19. This one's tricky because you don't hear the tens place when you say the number 19. When we put this in an expanded form, we have 10 plus nine. All right, and then one more, we have the number 40. When we think about putting this in expanded form, I don't really see a number in the ones place other than zero. So that's how we represent it in expanded form. 40 plus zero. Nice job, I think you guys are ready to add numbers using expanded form. When we add numbers using expanded form, we have to use a lot of steps. And sometimes when we're using a lot of steps, it can get really confusing. And sometimes it's hard to remember each step. But if we skip a step, it's gonna mess our whole problem up. So I put all of our steps on a chart for us today so that we make sure we don't forget any of them. So I'm gonna go over them and then we're gonna practice one all together. So our first step is to stack. And I always tell my students when we stack up our work, it's really just making it make sure that it's gonna be really neat and nice when we're at the end of it. We also have step two, which is identify. We can identify our tens and our ones place by putting a square around them or a circle. We could highlight them, or you can even just identify them right up here in your noggin. As long as you know what number's in the tens place and what number you know is in the ones place. 
And identifying really helps us with our next step, which is expanding. So when we expand our two numbers, it's really important that we know our tens and our ones. And then step four is gonna be adding. And we're gonna add our ones place and adding our tens place together. And then the final step is a super duper tricky mathematical term, and it's the word squish. I always get really excited when we're at this final step because what we do is our answer ends up in expanded form and we get to just answer. Let's try one together so you can see these steps in action. The first problem we're gonna try together today is 46 plus 21. Now our first step says to stack it up. And this step might seem kind of silly, but really it helps keeps our work really neat and nice, especially when we're first trying out adding using expanded form. So I'm gonna stack up my work. And when I stack it up, I'm really just making sure my tens and my ones are sitting on top of each other. So now that my work is stacked up, I know that I have completed step one. Now let's go to step two. It says to identify. Well, for today, since that's our first time, I'm gonna put a blue square around our tens place and a red circle around our ones place. And that's gonna really help us with expanding and making sure all of our numbers are in the right place. So I see a four in the tens place in the number 46, a two in the tens place in the number 21, and a six in the ones place in the number 46, and a one. So I see right here already, I have my 10 stacked on top of each other, my one stacked on top of each other, and my work is looking really neat and nice and ready to go. And now I have completed step two, which is to identify. Step three says to expand. Now I'm gonna put both of these numbers in expanded form. So I have the number 46. Well, I see I have four tens. I know that four tens is also the number 40. So we have 40 plus the number in my ones place, so plus six. Now I've put this number in expanded form. It's in line, everything's looking neat and nice and ready to go. Then I have the number 21. I have a two in the tens place, two tens is 20 plus my number in the ones place, which is a one. So now I have put both of my numbers in expanded form. I have already completed step three. We are moving right along. Step four says to add. Okay, now let's look at this problem and see what really are we adding together here. Well, when I add, I wanna make sure I have my addition sign coming down. I know this is what I'm going to do. We're first gonna add together our ones place. So I see my ones place, I have six plus one. This number is in my ones place. I remember that from where I circled it over here. So when I add six plus one, I can look at my number line. I have six, I'm adding one more, which is seven. So six plus one is seven. Now let's add together our tens place. I have 40 plus 20. I could count up 40 and then two more tens, 50, 60. I could also look at this and just look at the tens place because I know my zero is gonna stay the same. So I can also look at this as four plus two. So I have four plus one, two equals six. So bring it down. Four tens plus two tens is six tens or 60. So now I have finished adding. And my last step, the super mathematical step, is to squish it together. So my answer is right here. It's just sitting in expanded form. And I love squishing my numbers together because sometimes we would look at 60 plus seven and think, oh my gosh, that's a really big number. That's a really hard addition sentence when really all we have to do, squish it together. We squish our ones into the tens and we have 67. Woo, and we have finished squishing. Now, you might be sitting at home thinking, this is overish. That seemed like a lot of steps for a two-digit addition problem. 
But let me tell you, when you do your addition this way, you're really learning and understanding what's behind each number. And it's gonna help you out when you get to really big, long numbers or when you do multiplication or division. So it's really important that we have that number sense and really understand what's behind our numbers. All right, let's do another one. This time I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and do it along with me. All right, the problem we're gonna do is 53 plus 44. Can you go ahead and write that on your piece of paper? I want you right now, I'm gonna go through the steps a little bit slowly still, but I want you to see if you can work ahead of me. And when I get to that final squish step, I want you to see if you can be finished. All right, here we go. 53 plus 44, step one, stack it up. Okay, all right, I'm gonna stack up 53 plus 44. It's kind of a weird four. There we go, 53 plus 44. I finished step one, which is stacking. Step two, I look at my picture. I know I need to identify my next step. So I'm going to put a box around my tens place, a circle around my ones place. So if I put a box around my tens place in the number 53, I know I'm gonna put a box around five. And in the number 44, I know I'm gonna put a box around the four. This is nice because I see my tens are already stacked up and on top of each other, ready to go. Then I have a three in my ones place and a four in my ones place. Now I have officially identified the tens and the ones. So that makes it really, really nice and easy when I'm ready to expand, which is the next step. So if I want to expand the number 53, I see I have a box around my five in my tens place. So five tens is 50 plus the circled number, which is a three in the ones place. Then I have the number 44. I see I have a box around my four. Four tens is 40 plus a four in the ones place. Now I have finished expanding both two digit numbers. I think I'm ready for my next step, which is to add. First, I'm gonna add the numbers in my ones place. I have a three plus four. One, two, three, four. So three plus four equals seven. Now I can add together my tens. It's gonna be five tens plus four tens. Five tens plus one, two, three, four tens is nine tens or 90. Now that I've added, I get to do my final step of squishing and I get to squish it together. My seven takes over my ones and now I have 97. Boop, boop, boop. Is that the answer you got? Were you able to get there before me? If not, that's okay, because this is a lot of steps and this might be your first time trying it this way. All right, here's the word problem. My dog Rosie was given 37 tennis balls. It's a total dream of hers. 37 tennis balls. Then she went in the backyard and she saw 12 more tennis balls. Can you believe it? So she was given 37. She went outside and there were 12 more tennis balls. So how many tennis balls does she have in all? What's that problem that we're gonna stack up together? 37 tennis balls, 12 more outside. How many does she have all together? I want you to start your problem by stacking up 37 plus 12. Now, can you go through the steps on your own? Can you identify the tens and the ones place? Can you expand both of these two digit numbers? Can you then add them together? And then can you squish it all together at the end? I really, really think you can do it. Take your time, do your best to do every single step. And then at the end, you'll be so excited because you will now know how to add two two digit numbers using expanded form. Something a lot of people can't say they can do, which is really cool now you know how. All right, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming. This is Math Mania. My name is Mrs. Overish, and I will see you next week. Hello.
Hello and welcome back to first and second grade science with Miss Allen. I am so glad that you are here today. Next week we're going to talk about our planet Earth, but this week we're going to talk about the moon. Some of the planets in the solar system have more than one moon, but our planet Earth just has one moon and we're going to learn about that specific moon that orbits around our planet Earth. Last week we learned that Earth orbits the sun. The moon orbits Earth. We know that an orbit is the journey around. So the moon's orbit is 27 days. It takes 27 days for the moon to make its full journey around Earth. First, I want us to find out what do you think the moon is made out of? Hmm. Here's a picture of the moon. What do you think the moon is made out of? The moon is actually made out of rock and metal. And the outer layer of the moon is called lunar soil. It also has mountains and valleys and craters. It's not a flat surface. There's mountains and valleys and craters. What is a crater? And how is a crater made? Hmm, let's think about that. What is a crater? And how is a crater made? The moon's craters, or lunar craters, were created when asteroids or comets collided with the moon's surface. Over There are 9,000 craters on the surface of the moon. Simply, a crater is a circular hole that's created when an object from space hit the moon Next, we're gonna talk about the phases of the moon. Maybe you've heard of the phases of the moon before. There are eight major phases of the moon. The phases are how the moon appears in the sky to us on Earth. When we look into the sky, how much of the moon can we see? What does the moon look like? Sometimes it's the full moon and we can see all of the moon. And sometimes it's just part of the moon that is visible to us. Visible means something that we can see. The parts of the moon that are visible to us are the parts of the moon that are lit by the sun. The moon appears in the sky differently each day. Here's a progression of the eight phases of the moon. We start with a new moon then the waxing crescent, first quarter moon, waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, third quarter moon, and the waning crescent. And remember, it's just what part of the moon is visible to us at that time. All right, so we are gonna do our follow along activity and that is making a guide of the eight moon phases. So with me, I have a white piece of paper, I have a black crayon, a gray crayon, and a black marker. We're gonna fold our paper in half long ways. I'm going to fold the ends in to meet each other equally. So take that and fold it in half. When I open the paper, I'll have eight sections. If I cut down the middle, be able to attach these to make an accordion style book at the end. But first, let's start with our first moon face. I'm gonna use my black marker to draw a circle and I'm going to write new moon. 
the new moon is when the moon cannot be seen because we are looking at the unlit half of the moon. So the new moon occurs when the moon is directly in between the earth and sun. A solar eclipse can only happen at the new moon. So we cannot see the moon with the new moon. Okay, our next phase, waxing. Crescent. Moon, the waxing crescent moon, is when the moon looks like a crescent and the crescent increases in size. So it waxes in size from one day to the next. So I'm gonna draw the scene or the visible portion of the waxing crescent. All right, our next phase, first quarter moon. The first quarter moon is when half of the lit portion of the moon is visible after the waxing crescent phase. Half, so we can see half. I'm gonna draw a line down the middle. So I'm drawing, coloring in this half of the first quarter moon. First quarter. Next we have a waxing gibbous moon. So I'm gonna draw my outline. Waxing gibbous moon. So this occurs when more than half of the lit portion of the moon can be seen. And that portion is increasing or waxing. So we're gonna fill in that most of it can be seen. So the gray part that I'm coloring is the part that can be seen. So we have new moon, waxing crescent moon, first quarter moon, and waxing gibbous. I'm gonna grab my second sheet of paper. I'm gonna draw. my outline for the full moon. So we know that the moon's visibility was growing in these first phases, growing, growing, and now the entire moon is lit and the entire moon is visible when we see a full moon. I'm sure many of you have seen a full moon in the sky before. It's bright, it's big, we can see the full moon. Next we have waning gibbous moon. So now the moon is going to slowly become less visible again. This is a cycle, so this will happen over and over again. Waning means decreasing in size. So we're gonna be getting less visible again. Waning gibbous. So we had waxing gibbous, now we have waning. Increasing, waxing, decreasing, waning. So now we have our last quarter moon. I'm gonna call this third quarter moon. Again, we're decreasing in visibility. The gray shows which part of the moon is visible. Then our last phase in the cycle, our waning crescent moon.
So again, we can just see a sliver, just a crescent of the moon. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some tape. I'm gonna tape right in between the full moon and the waxing gibbous. Flip it over and put another piece of tape here on the back side. Now I've created a booklet, a guide to the moon phases. So you can use this to help determine which phase of the moon you see in the sky. Thanks for joining me this week and I will see you next Tuesday as we learn about the planet Earth. My name is Jin Yang. This is the Chinese class for grade one and grade two student, and also for beginners in learning Chinese. Welcome. Today, we are going to go over Chinese pronunciation and the pinyin. You can hear and distinguish some initials and finals, such as ma, na, f, l, some finals such as a, i, ao, an, an. Okay, let's get ready to learn. Qing ting wo shuo. Qing ting wo shuo. A. Ah, oh, oh, uh, uh, e, e, u, u, e, e. Ting ting wo shuo some consonants. B, p, m, f, d, t, l, n, g, k, h, j, ch, sh. Okay, now let's see some. Pinyin and the meaning. Ting ting wo shuo. Ma ma. Mao mao. Nao nao. Lao lao. M I my my N I nai nai L I lai lai M an man Man, n, an, nan, nan, f, an, fan, fan, l, an, lan, lan, m, an. Mang, mang, f, ang, fang, fang, l, ang, lang, lang. Excellent. Now, please distinguish which one do you hear. Ma, ma, 
This is number one. Please distinguish which one do you hear? Fun. 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 It's number two. Please distinguish which one do you hear? Long. Long. Long is number two. Long. Please distinguish which one do you hear? None. None. None is number one. Please distinguish which one do you hear? Long. 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 Number two. Long. Please distinguish which one do you hear? Long. Long. Lan is number one. Great. Now let's practice to say some pinyin with Yang Lao Shi. We can use our hand to mark the tongue. Ma, ma, ma. Mao Now Now Le Le Ao Lao Lao Ma Ma My My N, N, Nai, Nai, L, L, Lai, Lai, M, M, Man, Man, N, N. Nan, Nan, F, F, Fan, Fan, L, L, Lan, Lan, M, M. Mang, Mang, F, F, Fang, Fang, L, L, Lang, Lang. Now think about how to pronounce. This one. Nai. Nai. Let's try next one. Lai. Lai. Man. Man. How about this one? Nan, Nan, Mang, 
忙。How about this one? 方，方。How about this pinyin? 老，老。Do you get this one? 卖，卖。Let's try one more. 脑，脑。Excellent. Now let's review the basic vowels in Chinese pinyin. Ah, o, e, i, u, u. Excellent. After today's lesson. You can hear and distinguish some easy initials and finals. Assignment for this week: Practice saying some easy initials and finals we have just learned with your parent. For example, m, n. F, l, a, i, o, an, ang. That concludes our lesson for today. It has been my pleasure having you in this class. My name is Jin Yang. See you next week. 再见 Hope to have scholars and once again. Welcome to STEM for second grade. Today, we will demonstrate understanding of the design process by using the design process to brainstorm solutions to problems found in everyday life. Last week, we got a nice introduction to the design process, and we said that there were five steps: ask, explore, model, evaluate, and explain. We said that the design process is a step-by-step -step way to solve problems that is used to develop many possible solutions to a problem, and then narrow them down to one final choice. We also got the opportunity to look at two scholars that are your age that use this same design process to solve problems in their lives. We took a look at Mosiah Bridges. Who started out just wanting to make some extra money, so he and his grandmother teamed up and started Mo's Bows, and an adventure that started out just to make extra money now makes over two hundred thousand dollars a year. Mosiah Bridges also has clients like Barack Obama and Steve Harvey. Then we took a look at Natalie McGriffin. Who was uncomfortable with her beautiful skin and naturally textured hair? So she and her mother teamed up to start a book named *The Adventures of Moxie McGriffin*, where she explores her skin color and her naturally textured hair. We also looked at a line of pins that she has that accentuates that her beautiful skin tone and also. Her naturally textured hair. So today, we're going to take a look at how we can use this same design process to solve problems in our lives. Now, if you think back, if you remember last week, we started out by identifying a problem in our life that we felt we could come up. With a solution for, and for me, my problem was carrying around the iPad in the classroom while also using my stylus to post things on the 
board to draw and illustrate pictures for scholars without dropping the iPad or putting it down somewhere and forgetting where I put it. So during class last week, we sketched out one possible solution, which was to add a glove to the back of the case of the iPad. That way I can slip my hand in and still be able to use the iPad and I wouldn't have to worry about dropping it or forgetting where I put it. But remember, with the design process, we're looking for the opportunity to brainstorm many solutions and then narrow them down to one. So we identified our problem and then we asked the question, how can I keep from dropping the iPad and forgetting where I'm putting it down somewhere and forgetting where I put it? I know my solution is to attach the iPad some kind of way to my hand, but I'm not sure how. So now we move on to the exploration phase. We're going to explore options for keeping the iPad on my hand so that I don't forget where I put it or drop it. The first solution was a glove. The second solution was a strap. I thought I could just use a strap or a rubber band, slide my hand in it, and still use it without dropping it. And the third option was actually a Velcro strip where I can just strap my hand to the iPad and I still wouldn't have to uh, worry about dropping it or forgetting where I put it. So once I explored these options, my next step was to model these possible solutions. Well, the first uh, solution that I explored was the strap. So here's the strap, and this is called a prototype. And the way the strap works is you simply take the iPad out of the case, place the strap around the case, and then put the iPad back in the case. And now, I have my first option. Well, while I'm kind of happy with this, it's still kind of loose and it's not that comfortable at all. Um, it feels like if I were to put my hand down to my side, I would drop the iPad and it's pretty flimsy. So I modeled that one and I decided that I did not like it. The next option was the glove. Well, I decided that the glove option was not very feasible because it will require me to attach the glove some kind of way to the back of the iPad. And if something happened to where I wanted to take my hand out of the glove, it just didn't seem like it would be very comfortable. So I decided to skip over the glove option and go right to the option for Velcro. So now I have a nice Velcro strap on the back of the iPad. And once again, it is a much more comfortable fit. And just like before, now I can walk around using the iPad without worrying about dropping it. So at this point, I've gone through all of the phases of the design process. I asked myself how I could keep from dropping the iPad and I said, just attach it to my hand. Then I explored three ways to attach the iPad to my hand um, and I narrowed it down to my favorite option which is the Velcro option. Um, 
and after I modeled them I also evaluated them during the evaluation phase I found out that I didn't really like the glove option or the band option because the glove option wasn't very feasible and the band option um, was not sturdy enough for me so I test them out and I found out which one I like the best and now I'm at the explanation phase which is sharing this project with you and I'm able to share my grip tip iPad invention so I'm calling it the grip tip and it fits snug on your hand it has a nice velcro strap and for teachers that are interested in uh, not dropping their iPad still want to walk around the room and use the iPad this is an amazing option so once again now it's your turn think of your problem sketch out at least three solutions and then find out if there's any way that you can model these solutions so that you can test them at the evaluation phase and see if they work. If you come up with one solution that you really like, share it with your friends and family and find out how they can use that in their lives. All right, that's all I have for you guys today and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Ms. Horton, and thank you to all the other classroom teachers today. They all will be back next Tuesday with lessons targeted again for our first and second grade students. Tune in tomorrow, Wednesday, where we'll have lessons for grades three and four. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great day, and remember, continue learning throughout the day.